Yep, I'm getting nods that we're live. Uh, good. Jed's, <clears throat> Jed, our special tech engineer off camera, <laughs> telling us that we're live. So he'll also wave frantically at Renee if it's not working <laughs> or stops working. Hello, all. Welcome. Welcome to our special uh, Psalms and Prophets in a Pandemic. Can old texts speak to new crises? Uh, this is uh, an exciting event hosted by Tukli Uniting Church, uh, which will also later be um, found and able to be downloaded or, or streamed from Love, Rinse, Repeat, both either on our, through your podcast app or on Spotify or from our YouTube channel. Uh, my name, my name is, I'm Liam Miller, for those who don't know me, uh, he, him, his. I'm an ordained minister of the word, the Uniting Church in Australia, currently serving as a new growth minister in Tukli, New South Wales, on the central coast, uh, which is located on Darkinjung land. Uh, and at this time, I'll acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land and recognise that their sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, I want to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and recommit as someone who walks these lands to the on ongoing work of justice, reparations and reconciliation. And specifically as a minister in the Uniting Church, I commit to seeking to honor the covenant with the United Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress. A few months ago, at the pan when the pandemic's impact on our daily life and on our worshiping communities was beginning to come into effect, uh, I released a podcast episode on how to read the Bible uh, with Emmy Kegler and Melissa Flora Bixler. And you can find that again by looking up the podcast. The idea behind that episode was that the usual structures in which so many Christians traditionally read and hear scripture had been removed. And so I wanted to provide a fun, accessible conversation about how we can approach the Bible without those familiar frames. This event here tonight takes that a bit further and looks to make it more specific in asking not only how we read the Bible, but how do we read particular parts of the Bible, like the Psalms and the prophets, in the midst of a pandemic? What do they offer? What questions do they raise? What judgment and hope do they lay before us? At the heart of this uh, event lies a suspicion that the Psalms and the prophets are uniquely situated to speak into our current crisis. That for the most part, these texts are about making meaning when systems of meaning making are destroyed. They are about giving hope when all seems hopeless. They are about boldly proclaiming a future when a cataclysmic present seems to be obliterating the past. The suspicion is that these old texts can speak into a new pandemic. To help me explore this, I have assembled a trio of wonderful people uh, from across uh, the lands now called Australia, and I am going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, you know, maybe where you're, where you're record, where you're joining us from, what generally fills your day, and and I guess if you've started doing anything during COVID that has proved a particular comfort, uh, Monica, why don't you lead us off with this? Okay. Uh, thank you, Liam, for this uh, invitation to, uh, to this conversation. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what this uh, hour and a half will unfold, uh, both in terms of uh, my own learning, but also what I can contribute to, uh, to this discussion. Uh, I come from India, but I have been living in Australia now for about uh, nine years. And during that time, all that time, I have been teaching uh, Hebrew Bible Old Testament studies uh, at the uh, Pilgrim Theological College. Um, so, um, yeah, in Parkville. And I, um, I, 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 I love the Old Testament, um, and I feel like I'm sometimes doing some PR work uh, for the Old Testament, particularly within communities of the Uniting Church. Uh, because there's, uh, the Old Testament has received uh, uh, a lot of uh, bad press. <laughs> uh, and so I'm trying to work towards redeeming uh, the Old Testament and uh, what it offers uh, to us as communities of faith. Um, yeah, yeah. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll be interested at the end, we'll talk a little bit about some of those courses you teach and, and just how they do seek to that, that, that redemptive work. Yeah. Uh, Lindell. Hello everyone, I'm Lyndall Sherwin um, and I'm beaming in from part of the land of the Eora Nation, which is now known as Alambi Heights on the Northern Beaches. Um, oh, where to start? I'm married to Paul. I have three boys, um, Harry, Judah and Asher. Um, 
I just returned to work actually from one my main job from maternity leave. Um, Asher is, has just turned one. So returned to my main role last week. So I am an occupational therapist background. I've worked in the mental health sector for, oh goodness, 17 plus years now working with individuals and families and more recently with systems, um, supporting systems to be more recovery focused and holistic in terms of the way that they look at mental health um, and acknowledging and affirming lived expertise in that process as well. Um, I have been studying theology for far too long. I'm hoping to come to the end of that. Well, I do love the learning and I do love that process, but um, kind of coming to the end of a Master of Ministry at Mooring College um, and I'm part of a my local church here um, on the Northern Beaches, HDO Church DY, um, who I love, um, love being a part of, love being a part of that community and uh, being a part of uh, uh, a group of people figuring out how to follow Jesus. Um, uh, what was the other question around something around? Oh, uh, have you, have you has, have found any oh, new yes. comforts? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I have um, joined the bandwagon and become an ISO um, kind of cliche and have started making sourdough, which I love. <laughs> I love the process and it is, um, yeah, just this beautiful process of creating, nurturing something. I, I call my little starter my fourth baby and nurturing it and, um, yeah, making sourdough. So that's my little thing. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Renee? Um, thanks, Liam. Yep, my name's Renee. I'm a high school teacher. Um, I teach English and ancient history, um, which I love. I'm a very intense and passionate teacher. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess I'm a, I'm a bit of a lifelong learner. I um, did a Bachelor of Theology, um, then did my Bachelor of Arts in English and ancient history, um, and then a Master's of Teaching, which was a lot less exciting, um, but got me into an amazing job, which I love, which is teaching um, in public schools in Sydney. Um, and yeah, I am currently, what's filling my, my weeks, I am obviously teaching is, is huge <laughs> and has been huge during COVID, um, figuring out what the heck online learning is meant to look like. Um, but I also am a new resident of Marrickville, um, which is a land that belongs to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And we love Marrickville. We're kind of exploring the area, figuring out just how great it is. Um, but also um, being a part of a new church plant, which is Marrickville Baptist, which we absolutely love, um, run by the incredible John and Kate Cavanaugh. Um, so that's been filling our time a little bit as well. Um, but during Zoom, during COVID, I thought that I think I've been Zooming people way more than I ever anticipated socially. I never thought that I'd be interested in catching up with people on Zoom, but it's actually been really nice to connect with people who are not near me geographically, but I'm more open to Zoom than I was as a result of COVID. <laughs> yeah, great. Oh, thank you all. So... I guess I want to get started kind of broadly with about how maybe COVID has impacted how we read the Bible. And I don't necessarily mean, I mean, you can take this in a terms of maybe it's affected your hermeneutics, the way you interpret the Bible, but even just the simple act of the how. So for instance, for me, I feel like one of the big things that's changed is one of the main ways I read the Bible was that it was read to me uh, on a Sunday during worship. Um, that even when I was leading, you know, worship or preaching, I would still be sitting, um, you know, before the, you know, when, the, when someone else would come up to read. And I kind of had a practice of sitting in the front row. So I'm, you know, hearing the word, you know, with the gathered community. And so, but that hasn't been happening. Uh, so, yeah, so I guess that's a big way of how reading the Bible has changed me. It's now much more a solo affair and removed from the kind of the full, um, framework of, of, of the liturgy of the, the uh, gathered worship service. So I guess for, for any of you, just um, any ways in which reading the Bible has, has changed during this time? Uh, if I may start, um, I think uh, 
for me, there hasn't been a lot of change. Uh, I, 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 I'm not involved in, 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 you know, in the ministry of the word as such. Uh, uh, I do attend church, and so I, I do have the scriptures read to me, but um, uh, I'm spending a, a fair number of hours in a given day uh, you know, <laughs> uh, looking at biblical texts uh, in preparation for my, for my teaching. Uh, but I'd like to say that uh, that I have always identified myself as a contextual theologian and interpreter of the biblical text, uh, because I firmly believe that context matters, not just the context in which the Bible was was written uh, and received, uh, but also the context in which the reader or the interpreter is reading it from. And today's, uh, you know, received uh, context. And I guess the overarching context. Uh, during these times is the is is COVID, um, and therefore part of our responsibility as readers and interpreters of the biblical text is to uh, is to articulate a theology or create meaning uh, that is informed by this experience of COVID, um, and. Um, and so um, it has to be led, uh, it has, the Bible therefore has to be read in the light of and for the context of uh, COVID and to see how uh, God is speaking to us uh, through the biblical text uh, to address our need for, uh, for comfort or for meaning uh, in, 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 you know, in the face of this uh, uh, often unspoken despair uh, you know, and the horrendous effects of the uh, of the of the pandemic mm. i think it's really uh, uh yeah maybe i should let others speak and then i'll jump in because i i do have a little more to say or should i continue no go for it now go for it now. okay 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 because I, I i think one of the things that the that the the pandemic has exposed is the uh is the the blazing inequalities in the world today you know um uh, while the virus is an issue and how do we deal with the virus and you know uh, or how do we deal with yeah with bringing about uh, healing and you know the issues of vaccination etc and so on uh, the problem more is the, uh, the you know the rather hideous uh, uh, racism and xenophobia that has uh, that has come to the fore in the context of uh, of covid and how are you know uh, colonized subjects, you know, women, children, the poor, the Dalits in, uh, in India, migrant workers, you know, how, the, the discriminated and the oppressed, how are they weathering this, uh, this storm? And I, if you've been uh, keeping in, uh, in touch with, with how the news has played out uh, COVID in India, for example, a few months ago, it was like a massive exodus of migrant workers having to walk thousands of miles, you know, to return home because the government suddenly just closed down, uh, closed down everything. So how, how are these people with now with loss of jobs and uh, uh, some who have remained in the cities, how are they coping, you know, how have uh, abused and marginalized communities uh, suffered? And this is disproportionate uh, suffering, which is, which is actually criminal, you know, if you, uh, if you think about it. Um, uh, because of the withdrawal of, of care, of, uh, of social services, or just the fact that there isn't uh, sufficient, uh, you know, uh, availability of these services, you know, uh, for, uh, for, these, uh, for these people. Um, uh, so therefore, you know, uh, I, I, in this context, I think it is very easy for, for some of us to actually ignore the ways in which political and economic systems uh, have set up and maintained inequality uh, and, and how this inequality then plays out in race, uh, in racial terms, in gender terms uh, and class, uh, you know, uh, and class terms as well. So I think uh, we we need to be uh, quite sensitive to the uh, to the rhetoric uh, that normalizes these abuses uh, and perpetuates them in the name of culture, in the name of religion, politics, um, and so-called values. You know, be it Christian or otherwise, uh, uh, ethical and 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 social values. Um, I, I don't know if you are uh, if you are familiar with uh, or you might be familiar with the fact that there is one particular phrase that is doing the rounds uh, in in literature, which is uh, which is being called uh, epidemi. Sorry, I hope I can pronounce it properly. Epidemiological imaginary. <laughs> 
Okay, so this is, I mean, it is being defined in similar ways as Charles Taylor's definition of the social uh, imaginary. And what is, it, what is interesting here is that, you know, uh, phraseology and language that is used to define and to analyze uh, the epidemic is also being used to understand social and political life. And so they talk about, you know, the war on the virus is also, or, or the, the racism is a pandemic. You may have seen this on, on social media. So language that you use around epidemiology is being used also to define and to, uh, and to explain uh, various social ills in the world. And, uh, and so in a way, the epidemic or the pandemic that we are in has become a metaphor for explaining uh, social, uh, social ills. So, and I'm not saying that that is wrong, uh, uh, but I do have concerns around the use of the metaphor uh, because there is a tendency to universalize, universalize the, or homogenize the community. Uh, and to, uh, you know, which means then there are certain categories of people that will fall uh, that will fall through the uh, through the cracks. But having said that, uh, I guess the the challenge for me today uh, in this uh, at this time is how do I read the biblical text uh, um, with with sensitivity to epidemiology? Okay. Um, in other words, um, I think it's uh, it's important to uh, to realize even if you look at the prophetic literature, uh, oftentimes epidemics are forecast as a response to the uh, to the to the sins of the people. Or, okay, so it is it is a form of of punishment. So already a connection is being made. Although we look at it only in religious terms, we need to get away from that, and 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 see that there are connections being made by the uh, the biblical uh, speakers, like the prophets, uh, you know, who make connections between uh, pestilence or epidemics, uh, and and the. Uh, the ill will of certain category, you know, classes of people within the community, um, and the injustice uh, in the, uh, in the community. So, um, so I guess uh, how can we read biblical text uh, epidemi epidemiologically uh, uh, in order to um, uh, to solve a pro promise? Uh, sorry, to to solve a problem uh, that is uh, uh, you know that is a threat to collective well being. Okay, um, mm. so uh, unless we address the issue of collective well-being, uh, you know, I think co well, uh, we uh, we would not have actually brought about healing mm. from the COVID uh, mm. from the COVID in the world. So, uh, so therefore, you know, um, uh, how can we read uh, the uh, the biblical text in this way uh, so that um, that you know we can bring about holistic healing, uh, not just from the COVID, but also from the social uh, inequalities. Because you know that uh, you may have heard uh, several people talking about the fact that the, uh, that the COVID is an equalizer. It doesn't, it doesn't discriminate, you know, the rich and the poor. But I think it is important to understand uh, or at least acknowledge uh, as one uh, South Asian uh, literary scholar in, in Canada has said is that uh, is that um, th that this is utter nonsense? She says her name is Anjali Raza Kobe, and she says this is utterly nonsense because you you don't need to be a scholar of disease and the history of epidemics to know that this is utter nonsense. The virus has no preference except for what allows it to proliferate. Okay, so uh, um, and so here it is. Uh, you know, uh, people with economic privilege. Uh, definitely uh, are, are, are more sheltered from the virus mm -hmm. than those who do not have. And, you know, so as an Indian living here in the, in the comfort of, of Parkville, uh, in a nice house, uh, in, in a secure campus uh, with access to healthcare and, uh, you know, uh, easy to maintain social distance, uh, I'm actually, I, I actually experience a little bit of guilt when I see images uh, out coming out of India, you know, uh, and, the, and the slums and, and see that th th these, if the government uh, or structures of authority, uh, you know, um, address the issue in a more responsible manner, uh, then perhaps some of these people can also be safe, you know, would also be safe. So at the moment, um, economic privilege, uh, 
people, yeah, has has uh, sheltered uh, many, and mm. so therefore it's not really an equalizer as such. Mm. I think the the problem is the structures in in, in the at, at the center of power. Uh, who are not doing their work well, and Trump is a <laughs> is a good example, uh, which has resulted in these uh, thousands, you know, uh, yep. who have uh, who have died. Yeah. Mm. Mm. No, thank you for that. And I think that's really helpful in setting up that this um, and people have kind of used the language of you know the the pandemic being something of an apocalypse and that it has unveiled mm. uh, so many of these deeper inequalities and heightened them and intensified them and has unveiled some of the hubris of of you know, humanity pushing boundaries of, of where the environment is un, well, untouched and, and, you know, and all these kind of things, you know, so it, it's helpful to lay out that context of that this is a, um, an intersectional issue and one which exactly does impact people who have to live in higher density, does impact people who have to return to service jobs, um, does impact people who um, are not able to avail themselves of the health care of the country because they are undocumented or, or other like. So... Well, yeah, or in Australia, like the, the, uh, the, you know, a large number of deaths are from uh, the homes for, for the aged care facilities, yes. you know. Yeah. So, uh, so it, is the, it is the vulnerable people in our societies, no matter where, you know, no matter which mm -hmm. part of the world, who are most impacted by, uh, by the pandemic. So yeah. as, as, a, as an interpreter of the biblical text, my task is to determine how these people actually respond to the Bible from the context in which they find themselves. Mm, thank you. So Renee and Lyndall, just um, any kind of thoughts on either, you can just go from what Monica's been talking about or your own reading of the Bible during this time. Mm. I guess, yeah, for me, when you first asked that question, Liam, I thought, oh no, nothing's really changed about the way I read the Bible. But then I thought about it and I think it's connected to what Monica was saying around contextual um, kind of reading. And one of the positives and blessings for me in this um, during this time um, has been engaging with online mm. communities in reading the Bible together. Um, and I think for me, being able to pursue diversity in perspectives um, and different lived experiences and different theological perspectives in understanding the Bible and particularly contextually during this moment in time and what is going on globally, not just the pandemic, but what we're seeing or all the things that Monica was speaking about and, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and the movement across the globe, but also what that um, means for us in Australia, being able to hear voices, um, diversity and voices into that, um, in, in how we read the Bible and um, how we um, think about interpreting that has been a real blessing. Um, the other thing I've been deep in the Psalms, happened to have been deep in the Psalms in the last few months. And I think about what you were saying, Liam, about not having the word, you're not being in community, you're having the word read, read out to us as much in this moment in person. I found myself reading aloud myself, mm -hmm. um, which is a new thing for me. And I only kind of, I don't know, it's connected to what's going on now, but something, uh, you know, like a book like the Psalms or um, and in thinking about their original intention and that communal worship and, and people would have heard it read aloud and there's something about reading something aloud that you know covers you in a certain way or does something mm. um, to us in our being so that's been some little thing for me that I've um, found helpful in engaging in specifically the Psalms. Yeah I appreciate that and, and uh, you mentioned you know being deep in the Psalms with your study part of the reason Lyndall had to come on the event is she has all my books on the Psalms so uh, you know it's only fair that she, she, she came on. Um, yeah and I appreciate that. Uh, Renee? Um, yeah I definitely think that um, this has changed like that COVID has changed my capacity for engaging with scripture. I think that at different times this year I have felt a huge emotional weight and I know that that is very work related for me um, but I know that everyone has felt the emotional weight of COVID at different times yeah. but I think for me it's been it's been hard to wrestle with the fact that I have felt a little bit limited in my capacity to want to engage with some of the really dark stuff of scripture and i think um you know even specifically like being so honest about the, the prophets and the psalms when you first alerted me to this topic i'm like i don't even want to go there <laughs> this is huge and i 
I think I, I've had this tendency to go to things that are more accessible to me. I mean, I'm an ancient historian. I connect with scripture in a way that's, you know, intensely vigorous. And I always want my background and my historical context. And so reading scripture isn't kind of a cursory or a light experience for me. It's deeply nourishing, but it is, it's full on and it's so emotionally engaged. Mm -hmm. And I think there have been times this year where I've felt like I, I, I either can't engage or it's just been so hard to engage. Um, and so I think, as Lyndall said, I have connected with some like great people online, which I would never have previously found. Like there's podcasts that I've accessed that I probably wouldn't have readily gone to. I think that's been so helpful for me to still um, be open to some of like the, the bigger parts of scripture that I guess, uh, honestly, a tendency this year with the emotional weight of COVID is to avoid. Um, but I think it's been really helpful to be open to other voices to be so contextual, um, but also just to be real about kind of how big COVID has been and to let scripture speak into that. Great, thank you. Uh, if anyone's, if those who are watching live, feel free to uh, either comment with your own responses or if you have any questions, again, feel free to, to comment along. Let's, let's look. So one of the reasons I thought this event, you know, might have some legs is that the prophets and, and a lot of the Psalms are written and compiled within a community who've experienced a deep disruption, a shocking trauma, you know, destruction and removal from traditional meaning making symbols and structures and places uh, and, and routines. And, and so, you know, there's something comforting sometimes in, in encountering the expression of a feeling or a particular questioning that you yourself are facing. So I guess uh, these are more like the general thoughts of how do you think these texts that we're now talking about specifically, the prophets and the Psalms, composed in the particular context they were, might offer something for us today? And then I guess, what might that be? And I guess the, always the underlying question that here, what do we have to be cautious of when we try to go from there to here? Uh, I'll kick us off. <laughs> um, I'll probably focus more on the Psalms, but I guess, you know, the Psalms do express that full range and that full gamut of human experience, which is um, so connected to experience now. Um, all the, as I talk to my kids, big feelings, you know, the Psalms contains all those big feelings, all those big emotions, um, and that we don't, necessarily see um, elsewhere perhaps in scripture so much um, and where much of the rest of scripture is telling us stuff about God a lot in the Psalms is you know humans talking to God and bringing things to God and doing that in such a raw and um, vulnerable way um, and when I think about this time and you know Renee alluded to that as well the, the huge um, emotional impact and and for me thinking about um, mental well-being as well and the impact that this time has had on everyone in that sense and the full range of that um, and emotions and that emotional exhaustion and you know emotions have a beginning and a middle and an end and emotions have a cycle and I think the Psalms really show really have this movement of moving through that cycle of emotion but also um, not necessarily having answers um, people coming to God with questions and their rage and their fury, but their frustration and everything. Um, so I think the Psalms is hugely, um, you know, it's relatable in that sense. Um, and yeah, I think, I, you know, the, I, what always comes to me is, you know, nothing is, nothing is new under the sun. And I think some of the stuff that we hear in the Psalms, you know, it could be so, is so relatable to now. Um, and also the sense of, um, Monica kind of alluded to some of the systemic stuff that's that's being brought to light at the moment. Um, and I think what the Psalms and also the prophets do um, is really push us to examine those, um, examine injustice, examine um, establishment um, systems, whether they be political, whether they be religious. Um, and I think yeah, there is that connection there um, and examining principalities and powers. And um, 
yeah, so for me, the Psalms in particular, yeah, it really does have, have that connection. And I guess the cautions, and I'm, I'd love to hear Monica's um, take on this too, the, as we think about some, you know, these post-exilic kind of um, scriptures um, and the connection with, I suppose, the disobedience of God's people and um, what we see happen in the story of the story of God's people, you know, being cautious about that um, kind of raw application to now and um, looking at things as disobedience and um, kind of punishment on that. And I think we need to be cautious about who is who is speaking into that, who are the people that are saying that this is disobedience and punishment um, mm -hmm. and thinking about who is holding power and um, that kind of thing as well. I think it's a caution. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Renee, would you like to say speak? Or, no, I or, no, okay, okay, okay. I'll go ahead. Okay, I think it is important to uh, uh, to acknowledge the fact that yes, a lot of people will be questioning God and wondering why this is happening. What have we done? I mean, I can hear this from within uh, the members of my own family asking this question. You know, uh, and I don't have a ready uh, ready. Uh, or satisfying answer because it is it, it is a question that I wrestle with or or struggle with and I would probably look into the scriptures to to see if there is an answer but I think it's important to to first of all assure people that the pandemic is not a direct active punishment of God you know uh, I think for for some hardliners this this is an easy answer you know uh, but I think uh, you know uh, yeah, uh, suffering in the world, uh, uh, the consequence uh, that we are uh, we are experiencing now can be understood as a as a consequence of, of the human condition uh, that the Bible calls sin. You know, um, it it is a rebellion against uh, uh, against God in in the sense that we have not worked well enough or hard enough uh, to uh, to ensure. Uh, justice uh, or, uh, you know, our relationship with the earth, you know, and so, uh, yeah, the, 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 those are some ways in which you could, uh, you could address uh, perhaps this, uh, this question, but um, <clears throat> for me, uh, it, it is true that the, uh, I will begin with the Psalms as well, uh, Liam, if that's okay, is that these, uh, you know, the Psalms are, as, uh, as Lyndon pointed out, uh, you know, uh, exhibit a wide range of emotions. Uh, these are actually rantings, you know, <laughs> of the of the people of Israel, um, uh, you know, uh, who who uh, who are responding in 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 a way to uh, to their experiences of life, uh, or to the experiences in life and their experiences of God. Um, and you know, one interesting question that uh, that a scholar raises is that are the are the Psalms there for God's word? You know, considering the the, uh, uh, the uh, injunctions against the enemies and so on. So are these God's words, or are they human responses only, or are they both? You know, uh, that's a question I will leave to you uh, to determine. But I think what we get, uh, what we uh, as in as readers. Uh, receive out of reading the Psalms is a glimpse of how uh, this ancient community actually understood God, uh, understood herself uh, and related to God and responded to God. Uh, and so these addresses to God, whether in the form of hymns or prayers or laments and so on, uh, are addressed in a very personal way, uh, but using very formulaic language. And therefore the, the context is the cult. Um, I think if they were really, really uh, personal prayers that we would have a lot more detail with regard to who the enemies are or, you know, more details about you know, the kinds of or explicit description of the suffering uh, that they are uh, that they are experiencing. But uh, in any case, uh, the point that I would like to make is that, you know, uh, we, we often see the Psalms um, as um, as okay, the prayers uh, of complaint to God because the laments outnumber everything else in the Psalms. Um, um, one thing that the uh, that this reveals for me particularly is that God chose a community that was uh, that was not a d dumb object. <laughs> These people did not take anything. Uh, just lying down, whatever it was that you know that was meted out to them, they went head on mm. into into questioning into. Uh, you know, expressions of anger and, and curses and, and so on and so forth. And, and in a way, this is a conversation. 
uh, like you would probably have with someone who has upset you, you know? So they were upset with God. They were expect, uh, upset with the circumstances they found themselves. So whether it was personal suffering or corporate suffering in the form of, you know, war and conflict and so on, they did not uh, refrain from conversing with God. You know, they did not withdraw and say, okay, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm so angry. No, they gave expression uh, to what they were experiencing. Uh, but I think uh, the, the point that I want to really stress is that the Psalms are also prophetic. You know, they are not just, you know, prayers expressing anger and emotion, but they're also prophetic, prophetic in that they, uh, particularly and particularly the laments, they unmask and expose, you know, structures of oppression. They expose enemies, those that perpetrate uh, the injustices of the world. And so through the cry of the sufferer, they emphasize the need for writing this injustice uh, uh, because, the, because the establishment of justice in the world uh, uh, will, uh, you know, uh, lend to a return to the world that God, has, uh, that God has created. Unfortunately, we within the church, I think, have domesticated the Psalms. When, you know, if you ask someone to talk about justice, immediately it is the prophets that, be, that they would go to. Uh, but I think uh, uh, th that we see uh, justice and injustice uh, are vital expressions uh, within the Psalter. Um, and um, uh, as I said, they have been tamed and domesticated mm. and their radical and very revolutionary potential uh, has been submerged or suppressed uh, because of the cultic focus to some extent. You know, mm. these are prayers in the context of worship uh, or because, uh, yeah, yeah, or a juridical con. So therefore, uh, I think it is important uh, that while they are expressions of, uh, of sometimes personal and corporate piety, um, 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 the, the, these, these laments are also about protest, about revenge, about anger, and a cry for justice that emanates from uh, an experience of, of pain, of injustice, of suffering, of discrimination, of mm -hmm. perceived abandonment and rejection by, uh, by God. So, uh, I, so I think uh, how, uh, you know, if we are going to be reading the Psalms in the context of the pandemic, uh, we not only look for signs of hope and assurance within them, which the Psalms do offer, but we also have to look for uh, how they might, how they do address issues of, uh, of injustice and how do they see that injustice being corrected mm. um, uh, within the, the gamut of their, uh, of their experience. Thank you for that, Monica. I think maybe we'll pick up on this thread and, and Renee, I'll, I'll throw to you first here, but... Uh, a few people have pointed out, Cindy and, and, and Peter and, and Jed shared a quote about, you know, that, that again, picking up on that breadth of the, the, the Psalms and Cindy made a comment about how, you know, COVID has kind of allowed the church, a, a, you know, a rare time to actually get involved in some lament. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess maybe I'm, I'm wondering now, so how do we start to pick up on what we're saying is in the Psalms, right? Yes, hope mm -hmm. and assurance, but also lament and frustration and anger, but also that revolutionary prophetic mm -hmm. zeal and, and purpose and, you know, if there's one thing that the church has often been, you know, uh, not the one thing, if there's a thing that the church sometimes gets or po pockets of the church gets critiqued on is not allowing for the wide range of emotions and expressions and feelings and frustrations to be given voice and freedom, um, even in a controlled kind of, as you say, a formulaic manner within the, uh, the corporate worship moment. So how do we maybe take some of these things that we're talking about with the Psalms Okay. And and what might we start doing as the churches, or what might you already have seen being done in the churches that give this freedom and give this space um, and mm. voice uh, a, a wider voice to this breadth of emotions? Because often the psalms are just basically like gently reworked into a call to worship and then put aside. Um, if you're in a kind of you know more uniting mm. church center, mm. so I guess yeah, how do we start taking from here to what can the church either still in its you know, right now in the midst of the pandemic and then going forward as everyone starts to kind of really wrestle with what all this has been. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've just been reading some uh, literature on uh, African-American uh, uh, ethicist, a womanist uh, named Emily Towns. And, you know, one of the things she talks about is the fact that uh, you need to lament. Mm. And lament is the first step towards the healing process. Okay. Mm. 
Um, and so, uh, so therefore, you know, uh, the church needs to work harder uh, at uh, reclaiming uh, the, this tradition that is so much a part of uh, our scripture. I mean, I mean, the thing is, even the prophets who are always, you know, raining down words of, uh, of judgment on the people, and you, you know, in one of the questions you talked about Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is known for his laments, you know, mm. I mean, so, so even they, though they were prophesying to the people about the punishment that is going to come to them for the ills uh, that they were perpetuating, uh, when the ills did, when the punishment did come, they would lament, they would confess and they would lament, you know, mm. um, uh, and so, um, so lament, uh, and, and, and I think, um, uh, confession of sin is also a very strong uh, and uh, prominent element uh, within uh, within the lament uh, lament tradition. Mm. So uh, I think we, as uh, as, a com as communities of faith, uh, need to be brave enough to uh, to uh, to allow this you know this wide range of emotions to be expressed uh, within the context of uh, within the context of. I mean, if you if you go to some of the churches in the global south, you will experience this. You will see people crying and ranting. You will see people dancing, you know, um, uh, and shouting for joy, clapping, you know. I mean, so, so uh, um, uh, I guess I, I, I don't know what it is amongst us more educated city bred folk that we, uh, uh, that we think that there is a certain, uh, that, that that certain emotions need to be need to be uh, you know uh, marginalized or, or or should not be allowed within the confines of of worship, mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I think this also says something about who we understand God to be if we cannot express some of those emotions mm -hmm. uh, to God. Yeah, thank you, know? you. Yeah. Renee or Lindell wants to go next. Uh, I was going to say, um, I don't mean to cross promote here um, okay, for <laughs> before I checked with everyone, but, but um, Brene Brown's latest podcast, um, absolutely, it talks and addresses about this. I don't know if anyone's listened to it yet, but mm. it was absolutely fantastic in talking about like the literal physiological, biological need to engage with emotion. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, it's so cathartic. I, as I said before, my context was like definitely coming to the prophets with total fear of expecting to find judgment and not really needing that this year. I thought, oh, this is like so, I don't want to read about judgment. I don't want to read about like terrible things. This year is already terrible. Um, but looking at some of the prophets, I think I, I really underestimated how cathartic it would be to hear things that are in my head <laughs> about mm. just judging, you know, the way that um, people would, uh, the way that minorities were treated, the way that people were silenced, the way that um, the, this community felt displaced, the way, like all of the injustices that we see explored in the prophets, it just felt so real. It felt like they were saying exactly what I wanted to say. Mm. And I think for me, it was such a good reorientation to remember like what is what is wrong and that the, what is wrong is wrong because i think in this context we've you know justified so many things you know economically politically like we've had to organize us reorganize ourselves under covid there's just been so many aspects to it that like a lot of you know our rights for the minority for minority people or our rights for um those who are really affected in such a disproportionately bad way in covid um we've it's kind of been justified in different ways. And it's so good to come back to these like really clear lament scriptures that remind us that like poverty is trash. And like we have, like this is a rage to us that people are being treated like this and experiencing this. And so for me, I just felt like so relieved that it, I, I was able to really just sit into like, what are the values of God? Like, what is God's heart? And, and he hates this, like, this is injustice in every kind. This is, this is the worst. Um, so I really felt so relieved by that, that I was reading scripture that felt like exactly what I was saying. <laughs> um, but it also, I think just reminded me of how much the church has this 
epic responsibility to be hopeful in the midst of total despair and darkness because there is always these glimpses no matter how like you know it's particularly the minor prophets like it's it's basically 99 percent sadness <laughs> and then there's just these glimpses of like of hope which you absolutely i think you know from my english teacher perspective looking at it which you just they they just jump out at you because you've you've just sat in lament and you've just like sat with this emotion for real insert Brene Brown's podcast. You have really <laughs> sat in this podcast, in this um, emotion, you really just felt everything that you're meant to feel, anger, frustration, hurt. Mm. And then you see light because that is what we have this rich language for it. We know that God's heart just pumps for justice, which, you know, expresses itself in the prophets as hating injustice but we know that the other side to that is absolute love. Mm. So I think I've just felt really, um, I've appreciated this journey of engaging with this in the midst of a pandemic and knowing that there is such a language for what God's heart is and for, you know, where, where my role is to actually speak hope in a dark place, mm -hmm. um, which is not pithy. It's not like, yeah, but God is good. It's actually sitting with the horrible stuff and knowing that there's a path through. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think I think it's very important uh, that you said that, uh, Renee, because very often I, I think it is it is it is important to acknowledge the fact that within the context of worship or reading the Psalms within the context of worship actually the, the, is important because the Psalms enable or they uh, they they penetrate as one scholar calls it a numbness you know to human suffering mm -hmm. um, because. And, and I think, and, and he continues to say that the, that the deepest form of worship, okay, the deepest form of worship is actually uh, one uh, that is rooted uh, uh, itself in a form of uh, confrontation with the ills of the, uh, and injustices that people, uh, that people suffer. So, you know, I mean, uh, we don't read the Psalms from a social perspective, but I think the more we do that, uh, we will allow the Psalms to speak into our current, uh, current reality. Mm, thank you. Mm. Lindo, did you want to add something here? I too have listened to that podcast, Renee, and I thought it was <laughs> awesome. But yeah, so. going back to the emotion stuff, um, yeah, we can get stuck in emotions and that's when things become overwhelming and, and exhaustion and lead to, um, you know, really negative things for individuals and communities as a whole. And I think the Psalms and particularly lament, you know, it's this process that models this, this process. It's not just a stuckness in a particular emotion, but it's that real expression of that, that raw expression of that. But there's this movement, understanding the context of who God is and what he is about. He's a God of justice. Um, and it's, yeah, there is, there is movement through the Psalms that we see and it, Lament is about movement. It's not about just being stuck in the the despair or whinging or there is action. Um, and I think we see we see that through the Psalms and modelled through that, which is a really kind of unique thing. And is it Brueggemann that talks about the lost art of lament? Is it him? Yeah. Yeah. He's the, yeah, he's the one who also talks about the fact that you know the, 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 this movement that you speak of is you know from disorientation yeah. to uh, to, to to transformation or healing, so mm. you know, mm. uh, yeah, from orientation to disorientation to reorientation, to trans reorientation. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Hey, Renee, just quickly, just say love, rinse, repeat, just quickly. Love, rinse, repeat. Great. I'm just going to splice that in when you were just talking about Renee Brown's <laughs> podcast, just so everyone you know stays on brand. Uh, so, so love, rinse, repeat. Yeah, thanks for that. That sounded really natural. Um, <laughs> Well, um, Monica mentioned Jeremiah before, and I was thinking about, you know, often through the pandemic, um, both in terms of the health side of things and the spread of the pandemic, there have been those who have sought to downplay the threat. Like, it's not really that bad if you catch it. So few catch it. Isn't it just like the flu? Um, then also they've been on, on terms of the other, like, you know, the um, issues of racial injustice and racial unrest. We had when the Black Lives Matter protests were really kicking off after, again, after the uh, uh, murder of George Floyd, there was the, you know, Scott Morrison saying, we don't need to import issues that are not present here. Uh, you know, and, and, and you, all I can think of when you're hearing, you know, malarkey like that is, is Jeremiah saying, you know, they say peace, peace when there is no peace. And I guess, you know, what, what is it that the prophets help us 
grasp in terms of part of the role of the Christian or part of the role of someone standing in that prophetic tradition is to tell the truth and demand that the truth be told, um, even if that truth is not necessarily the good news that we want it to be, not necessarily the, the um, optimistic news that we want it to be, not necessarily the comfortable news that we want it to be. So I guess that, that, that kind of prophetic tradition of, of telling the truth and demanding that the truth comes out. Uh, and how do we stand in that? How, how, how do we live those lives? How do we form communities in that, in that um, line? I think offering uh, shallow messages of betterment like Trump does or <laughs> others, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, is not the answer to, to, the, current, uh, to the current problem. Um, uh, I think what is important, well, within the prophetic tradition, of course, uh, particularly in Jeremiah, this prophet against prophet uh, is a very common trope uh, in the in the Hebrew Bible, you know, uh, and the and the tensions between uh, between these so-called false prophets and uh, and the prophets. But who the real prophets were and who the false prophets were was something that could only be determined much uh, much later, uh, much later, of course. Um, so, um, <clears throat> um, so I think um, I think uh, I, I'm reminded here of a book uh, that I have somewhere in my in my collection, uh, and the title is uh, "Good News That Is Bad News That Is Good News." You know, uh, so so in a, <laughs> so uh, so in, in a sense, the uh, what Jeremiah is con is co is confronting uh, in the, in this text uh, in. Um, is uh, in chapter twenty-three, is it? Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, he, cha yeah, he, he attacks other prophets in in, in several parts of the, uh, you know, in, in, in several chapters. Uh, but here uh, in chapter twenty-three, uh, he 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 is confronting this dilemma uh, of false prophecy and is 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 uh, is is proclaiming a word that is not uh, that doesn't sit well with with the people who are hearing it because it is calling for certain changes in, in, in the structures or call, calling for certain changes in the, in the, uh, in the individual uh, behavior of, of people or, you know. Um, and so uh, when, 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 when the status quo is, is, uh, is, is shaken, uh, the news is not, uh, is not, is not received uh, very well. So um, I guess part of the part of the calling of of ministers or of the church is to actually uh, enable people to be able to discern between what is the truth and what is what is not the truth. Um, that is being prophetic. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, others I appreciate might that. want to say more. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add, like, it's we. I mean, we're it's so obviously called ten thousand times to love the vulnerable, mm -hmm. and when we're seeing the vulnerable dying and the vulnerable sick and the vulnerable affected disproportionately by this issue, it's there's no way to square that other than to like absolutely love them and be with them, which is inconvenient and it requires us to completely change, um, possibly you know change our way of doing church, change our change so many things about our life. It's incredibly inconvenient, but. It's absolutely what we're called to do. And I think it's been so sad to see churches not do that. And it's been so beautiful to see churches do that, provide these places of inclusivity. And I know it's been really exciting to see like um, H3O, a Baptist church in DY, um, like completely kind of rethink themselves with small groups and with online communities, which have, it's been amazing to see like how churches have adapted and are, uh, continuing to try and love those who for whom church is just not accessible to right now and it's not safe and then you kind of see these other examples that obviously get publicized and you and it just feels gross because of course we're, we're called to love the vulnerable and it's it's just it's it feels very stark um to see who who is doing that and who is not doing that i'm sorry that's yeah. quite blank no no that's very very that's <laughs> yeah. good thank you yeah yeah mm -hmm. Uh, Lindo, I, mean. I think just to add to that, um, you know, the prophets are concerned about speaking truth, like calling, calling God's people back to truth, back to um, being holy, being set apart, being part of God's shalom and the flourishing of all people, um, and that, and most importantly, the the vulnerable and the marginalised. And I think um, that is a good um, and helpful lens to be looking at. 
this mm -hmm. moment in time through, you know, um, how, how are we as God's people, how are we as followers of Jesus affirming and upholding um, all of God's image bearers, um, pursuing shalom. And I think um, you can't turn a blind eye to the fact that there are, there is incredible suffering. Mm. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I think the prophets do, pro, you know, provide a lens um, in which we can look at this through. Yeah, I think while the prophets offer, you know, um, proclamations of, of, uh, of punishment or judgment, they do also offer uh, oracles of salvation, you know, of hope. Um, and I think one thing that, uh, that, that we tend not to perhaps emphasize when looking at prophetic literature is the fact that the prophets also interceded uh, for the community. You know, uh, when the, they know they are aware of the sin of the community, uh, they, the, and yet they are also quite aware of the graciousness and the mercy uh, that lies in God, and therefore interceded on behalf of the people. Um, and so, um, um, yeah, but but the intercessions, the intercessions, I think, <laughs> should uh, while they offer hope uh, and comfort. Um, the intercessions also need to uh, need to you know stir people into action to 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 bring about you know balance mm -hmm. in, in in structures and, and so on and so forth yeah and I think like something I'm thinking about is okay so you know what would it look like for the church to be known that if you are someone who realizes like are confronted with the truth that, oh, I'm a part of a system that, or a structure or an organization or a governmental body that is causing harm, that is doing death, that is propagating lies. Mm -hmm. I can leave this, right? I can walk away, I can whistle blow, I can do whatever I need to do, and I can go to the nearest church and, you know, they're going to provide for me while, because I'm about to get fired, <laughs> right? And they're going to provide for me and, 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 and then help me work through and, and lament and repent from my participation in this and my role in this. But, like, how can we be a people who know, you know, who are known by, if you need to take that risk of being someone who has to tell a hard truth in a place for the flourishing of those who are currently oppressed, the church will, um, you know, pick up the check, uh, so to speak. So, so, you know, but being amidst a community and knowing that we are people who will stand by those who tell the truth, uh, even when it is something that, that becomes quite costly, I think is something that is, a, is a, a worthy pursuit of the church. Yeah, I think reading through the prophetic literature and, uh, and the Psalter as well, uh, one of the things that these texts do uh, to a worshipping community is actually, uh, as Ellen Davies, uh, another Old Testament theologian uh, and feminist talks about, is that they um, help us identify ourselves uh, in that literature, you know, because I think we, that is the way, way we read the Bible. When we're reading narratives, we are always identifying with the character within the, in the story. And, you know, we, we don't, uh, it's only while perhaps going, in, uh, engaging in a Bible study, you might stop and say, well, why do I like this character and not that one, you know? Uh, but otherwise, when we are just reading it, we, we automatically tend to, uh, to identify uh, ourselves as readers with a particular uh, with a particular character or with a particular uh, with a particular concept, but what the uh, we never see ourselves as those who are perpetrating the violence, and you know um, uh, what is what is interesting is 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 when you speak to uh, when you read the Psalms along with uh, with the marginalized, they will tell you who the enemies are. They, they, yeah. they do not speak of enemies in abstract terms. They will concretize, you know, the identity of the, of the enemy. And I think, uh, I, I, pardon me for saying this, but in the West, um, um, I think uh, if, if people really ask that question of themselves, you, you would probably, we would probably uh, come to the conclusion that we are the enemy mm -hmm. because we are very much a part of those structures uh, that are contributing to the inequalities uh, in the world, either through our policies or either through our silence uh, or our, uh, you know, passiveness <laughs> uh, to, to what is happening, uh, our passive responses to what is happening uh, in the world. And I include myself. I include myself. 
I think that's that is very very helpful and 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 a, a really valid and important challenge and one that needs to be wrestled with and then and worked through and um, and then yeah how do we understand that okay we're in a weird global economy we can't extricate ourselves completely from complicity but what can we do mm-hmm. and what needs to be done um, and, and it begins with the truth telling and then and then goes from there into action. Mm. And so. I think- Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I think too, it's about who are we listening to, who are we listening to yep. um, as well and who we're being led by, I think is an important piece as well. Indeed. Yeah. yeah thank you for that. Uh, so another thing that you're going to come across a lot if you read the prophets uh, along with, you know, uh, you know, implications to tell the truth is, uh, you know, an aversion or hatred of idols. Uh, you know, idols are this, you know, are the great threat often to the people's uh, life before God and life amidst one another. And, you know, you know and that, that runs through scripture, right? Scripture is, uh, you know, a great battle with, with the people of God and with idols. And, the, and, and, and so during this, I think then also of, so we've had people who are saying, hey, it's not so bad. And then you have another side who are saying, okay, it's bad, but look, if the economy is upset, it will it will rage in, against us, and we will all be destroyed. So we have to satisfy our great God Mammon or Moloch, and uh, and sacrifice those in aged care facilities, or sacrifice those with you know immunocompromised, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and and go back to work. We need to open our stores. We need to open our bars and restaurants. We need to do all this because. Um, the economy is is too big to fail, kind of thing. And then, okay, there can be nuance within some of these arguments, but there's also been plenty which are not nuanced at all. And so, I guess the question is, you know, as as those who are now trying to read the Psalms and the Prophets uh, and, and and the great breadth of Scripture, do we need to do we need to get more emphatic and focused on smashing idols uh, for the for the good of our the flourishing of our communities and, and, and for the, the, the lives of the vulnerable. Do we need to get out some, you know, do we need to find those golden calves and, and smash them to pieces? <laughs> and how do we do it? <laughs> oh, it's such a good question. I, I, I don't actually, yeah, I don't want to say too much because I just felt like, I was so troubled by <laughs> this idea that people, yeah, it, it, it feels so clear to me that we um, uphold the, the rights of those who, who cannot speak. And I just, I'm so troubled by the thought that we, yeah, we, we protect, we, we have these ways of justifying, um, you know, bigger picture, um, economic policies, political policies, but it's, ex- I, I absolutely second what Monica was saying before, about these structures that are uh, that just perpetuate inequity, and I mean that that we have to rage against. I I don't know how. I'd like your thoughts. <laughs> I'd like your thoughts about like busting idols. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, yeah, we all have our idols. I think uh, every community, every individual, uh, we don't necessarily think of them as as idols, but there are certain things that take prominence in our lives uh, over against the well-being of, of the community and and they are harmful. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, t- sorry, today I was, uh, I, I just happened to watch a little clip of, uh, of someone interviewing David Attenborough. And uh, I don't know whether you watched that, but in he, he says the, uh, one of the major problems in the world today is greed. Mm-hmm. Uh, Elsa Tamez, uh, 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 a feminist theologian from South America, uh, more particularly from uh, from Costa Rica, she she too talks about the sin of, of of people being greed. You know, it is greed, the greed for for wealth, or power, or or status. You know, uh, etc. So so um, so Attenborough was saying today, uh, we have to start living life differently. You know, um, if we are working towards uh, acquiring uh, acquiring more than your uh, a proportionate share of <laughs> of wealth, then that is that that means the wealth is an idol, and that that way of living has to be dismantled uh, in order that you know wealth is. 
so uh, so i think there are there are definitely pointers within the uh, hebrew bible and definitely within the new testament as well uh, which uh, which talk about you know uh, the pre monarchic days <laughs> where uh, where uh, the economy was a more subsistence kind where there was there was sharing there was sensitivity to the needs of others and there are pockets in the world where that kind of lifestyle is being uh, is being practiced i mean this cope one of amongst all the uh, you know injustices and uh, problems in the world that the covid has exposed uh, the 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 shutting down of uh, you know or restricting movement has resulted in such uh, uh, what you'd say uh, perceivable difference <laughs> in how the earth is functioning today right i mean in india for example um, they could see the himalayas from about 250 kilometers away but they couldn't see beyond 3 kilometers or something you know at one time but now they could they can they could see the mountains i mean it's so these small um but significant uh, differences uh, also point to the fact that some you know few changes that we make will have you know massive uh, uh, what is the word? <laughs> um, some massive um, good good things you know, will uh, will be the outcome. Yeah, thank you, um, Lindo. I think yeah, I echo um, Renee's thoughts there at the beginning. I think for me, um, yeah, it's about listening and engaging with um, other voices and hearing example of you know what can be described as you know the jubilee economics um and people engaging in small things that um upholds um the flourishing of all people and how people are doing this and enacting this in small and big ways um but i think exposing myself to um other voices that cause me to reflect and really think about how i contribute to this in my space um because, you know, I, I do live in a space of privilege and um, it's not okay to just say that. Um, I have to really, really reflect on that and really listen to others and have others speak into that and expose that, um, that then can lead to action. Um, yeah, is what I would say mm -hmm. around that. Mm -hmm. Starting mm -hmm. with myself and idols, yeah. Renee? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I think, Something I was thinking about was why this ancient community continues to pass down stories of trauma. Mm -hmm. And like, this is not pleasant stuff to read, especially, you know, I'm thinking of like Amos and Joel and like, this is intense and this is, it's, it's, it's sharp language. And again, like we've, we've talked about this already, but it's like confronting the truth and reminding ourselves that this like of, of the reality of suffering mm -hmm. and the reality of these injustices which can give us that motivation to bust idols because we're you know we we stop justifying why we are doing what we're doing when we engage with the, that emotional truth of the trauma that of, I mean for the Israelite community was the trauma of their dissociation their, and their removal from place and everything that it was involved with that and for us, I mean, there's so much with COVID, but yeah, just engaging with those stories again and again, like what, what is the point of continuing to, to, to dwell in this horrible stuff? Well, it's real. Like this is what people are really experiencing right now. They're, they're feeling silenced, they're feeling shamed, they're feeling vulnerable, they're feeling unsafe. Um, and that reminds us that there's a reason to challenge what is going on. I think it's important to acknowledge that the trauma that the communities are facing today uh, is on a continuum. Okay, so a community 2000 years ago or more experienced something similar and you know that and that is replicated over the over generations periodically it's the same. So we are on a continuum and I think it's that these these stories or these experiences are enshrined within the biblical text. Uh, because they, they, they offer for us the opportunity to wrestle with them. Uh, because they are part of scripture, you're forced to wrestle with them. Mm. You know? uh, 
students often ask me, how can we, uh, how can we have all these violent texts within the scripture? And, and my, my, uh, my question to them is, does it disturb you because it is part of scripture? So what is your understanding of scripture? Okay. Because for some people, scripture is all about words that make you feel good. They should not disturb. They should not destabilize you, you know, mm. whereas, the, but it, it, it because I think the far more important is the fact that scripture actually uh, allows you to, to reflect and to wrestle and to, uh, and to be disturbed, mm. you know, um, because it is only when you are disturbed that you will do something <laughs> perhaps uh, mm. about it. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, as uh, ministers within the church, uh, we, we, all, we, we feel that, the, that, the word, that the, even our preaching should be one that makes people feel good <laughs> and happy. Uh, Jesus loves me. Great. That's the message for the day. No, I think uh, part of the calling of the church and the, and the ministers is to, is to, uh, um, is to yeah, shake people a little bit. <laughs> Uh, so that they go out and do something about uh, rectifying the injustices uh, in the world, uh, because that is what Jesus was doing, you know, and that yeah. is what God is calling the prophets to be doing, um, to rectify these imbalances and, uh, and injustices in the world. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'm very, very uh, convinced that the Hebrew Bible particularly, and I was, uh, you know, New Testament, maybe Liam can speak about it, but a little appendix. Me, <laughs> yeah, but for me, uh, I think the, the stories within the biblical tradition actually reflect reality. They reflect life. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a very human document in that way. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, um, by, by, by narrating human experiences and human struggles and human questions, uh, the, it, is, it is giving us, the readers, the opportunity to to see, okay, well, how did they resolve those those questions at that time, and how do we resolve them today? And we try to gain some insight from the way they dealt with it. We don't mm. necessarily have to emulate what they did, but at least, you know, know that this is the problem, and this is perhaps, you know, and find a find a way to resolve it. Yeah. I mean, the violence within the Hebrew Bible is not for us to emulate. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that is, yeah. Mm. I think I, I, I appreciate that, Monica, so much with the, that, that idea, you know, that, that this is there to disturb, like that we do need that. And I think one of the things I like to think I, I've been trying to wrestle with more with, you know, this kind of question about idolatry and, and false, false gods in terms of greed and wealth and uh, various forms of privilege and, you know, like the, you know, the false god of white supremacy and these kind of things is, is to, you know, put them in that theological language that gives it such weight, that talk about it as demonic. And, and then I think also for myself, trying to understand it as someone who is, you know, at the height of privilege of being a white, cishet, male, overly educated, middle class, you know, able-bodied, et cetera, et cetera, that like, okay, it is good for me to be involved in movements for justice and, and the like, and to become aware of, of systems of inequality, yes, for the good of those who are currently have the boot on their neck, who are oppressed and marginalized. It is also good because this system is a threat to my mortal soul. Mm. This system puts me, it tries to convince me every day I am more godlike than man. You know, this, this, mm. that I have the ability to have, think my perspective is universal. That, 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 that tells me that that will isolate me from others because it will put me in a position where I don't rely on community. I don't need to rely on God because I've got, you know, I can just stroll merrily down the middle of the street and no harm shall befall me. You know, like I, I am at a threat of constantly losing the realization that I have a total dependence on God, that I am one who is born to live in community and not alone, that I am, you know, easily could um, associate my blessings with, you know, God blessings and not just the, the ill begotten spoils of an unequal society. You know, my, you know, the, my ability to live a life as a disciple and a life in community and a life before God that knows its place before God is constantly under threat in a society that seeks to heap privilege on me. So as much as I need to get involved in these, the, these movements for justice because others are dying and others are, you know, infringed upon and their humanity is limited and all that, I need to do it because without it, I will rot from the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. 
That's so good. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's that's and and that's that's very important, Liam. That you that you know you come to that recognition. Even if you read through in in the Psalms, very often you will see that the lamenter is uh, is uh, is speaking of the enemy in in animal terms, calling them the bears, the lions, you know, <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or or yeah, or the foxes or the dogs, you know, snapping mm. at at my heels, like in Psalm twenty two. And and then this and the psalmist then talks about I feel like a you know uh, I, like a worm, so in in other way in other words what what that particular psalm Psalm twenty two actually um, brings home to me is the fact that how is is the fact that these structures of oppression that privileges some and dehumanize uh, and you know marginalizes mm. others actually dehumanizes both. Yep. Yeah. Okay? Both the both the sufferer. And the uh, and the perpetrator of mm. oppression, um, because that is and that is not human, mm. you know. That way of behaving is not uh, is not human. So so much, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's so good. All right, so I think we have one more question. We have time for one more question, and um, well, it's good we were just talking about about enemies and and psalms. So. So President Trump, who's come up a couple of times, recently tested positive and was treated for, for COVID. Uh, it seems more and more likely it actually happened. Um, and a lively discussion kind of began about what does it mean uh, to observe Jesus' command to pray for one's enemies, uh, with many pointing out that Jesus does not in any way dictate the content of said prayers. We're just told to love our enemies and pray for those uh, who persecute us. So... Uh, Given that Jesus' uh, Jesus's prayer book was the Psalms and he made use of a wide range of them in his life, in his own prayers, in his ministry, in his teaching, can we say that the words of Psalm 109, which are or this, this one little verse, may his days be few and another seize his office, uh, are themselves an appropriate way to pray for our enemies <laughs> when our enemies have wrought such death and destruction? Mm. It is a lovely alternative for me, Liam. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I mean, I first read this and I just thought, wow, I'd never thought about it. I, I'd never thought about that verse. And I mean, it, it, it felt like it's something I could pray. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think I, I, I really felt a bit unqualified to respond to this. I shouldn't have even started speaking. So I'm going to pass this over. But I just wanted to thank you for this question. Uh, this right. is so provoking. <laughs> I think this is one of the questions that uh, that irks a lot of uh, people. Even in the classes, I you know in the units that when I teach the Psalms, there are there are individuals who have said I never read the Psalms. I find them too disturbing. That it's too they are too violent. Mm -hmm. I've heard of one congregation here in Melbourne that doesn't read the Psalms at all in mm -hmm. worship. You know, uh, so they have actually ex uh, exercised that. <laughs> <laughs> that portion of uh, portion of scripture Th that doesn't sit well with me actually because I think when we have as as a faith community embrace this canon we have to be uh, accountable to all of its contents you know and we have a responsibility to wrestle with why the this such material is there within uh, within our canon why did the canonizers actually include you know words like uh, you know these these texts that that might come across as being extremely violent so um and i guess so the the, the question then was you know so how do we understand these violent uh, texts in the psalms uh, that heap uh, curses on the uh, on the enemies uh, what what role might they play in the piety of our christian community today um and um I think excluding them, as I said already, would uh, would not be would not be the right way to go. Uh, there are some Christians who think that uh, you know now that we have Jesus, we don't need uh, we don't need the Old Testament God anymore. Uh, this is in some ways, I think, supersessionist, um, and um, and you know. Uh, Christians might might lend themselves to believe that they have now replaced the Jews, and so so um, you know, particularly in in response to uh, to to the the kind of you know the text that you or, or similar text that you have just called attention to. Uh, I think earlier on in the conversation we talked about the fact that you know uh, these prayers or these laments, uh, which are also heaping curses on the uh, on the enemy. Uh, uh, have a cathartic element to them, 
you know, mm-hmm. so, okay, so they have to give vent to their anger. And I think we as individuals who have not perhaps suffered a similar, a similar pain or, or, uh, or, uh, or have gone through a similar experience cannot hold them in judgment for using this language. Okay. If the psalmist is calling for uh, for the for children to be bashed against uh, against the rocks, it is because their own children have been bashed against the rocks. You know, um, I remember once listening to uh, an instance where a, a young woman who who was held hold, hostage in in Kashmir, um, um, you know, the father eventually was able to get access to the gun and 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 shot the uh, the guys who were holding them hostage because the life of the daughter wasn't. Uh, so you know you, you, so in those kinds of instances, what what a parent does for the safety of their own children, what what uh, uh, what a community does uh, for for its own safety uh, through prayer is. Uh, uh, it cannot be judged, and I think th- there are various ways in which people have tried to understand these violent elements within the within the Hebrew Bible, particularly within the uh, within the Psalms. So catharsis is something that we've already discussed. Okay, mm-hmm. um, uh, but um, <clears throat> um, Patrick Miller is another uh, Psalm scholar who. Uh, Old Testament theologian who talks about the fact that the Psalms are about letting go and holding back. Okay, so he he he, he talks about uh, the fact that these uh, laments, uh, which are heaping curses on the enemies, are offered in the context of worship within the cult. Okay, so uh, you might I don't know whether this response will satisfy you, but his answer is that that. Uh, uh, that within the context of worship, when a, when a, when a psalmist uh, prays these prayers, um, uh, this, the psalmist is not exacting revenge, but leaving it up to God. Mm. Okay. Um, so, um, so the the, the 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 violence is prayed, you know, rather than executing, rather than executing the violence. The violence is not executed. The violence is prayed, and so. Um, uh, this uh, is, um, and the community then becomes uh, the buffer to uh, to restrain the individual from committing, from going out and exacting that revenge. So now, when the community uh, responds to the prayer by saying "Amen," the community has now taken ownership of the, what that person is experiencing. Am I making sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so therefore, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, it is important to acknowledge that these are prayers that were uttered uh, in the context of communal worship and the community has heard the prayer and the community now stands by the one who is suffering uh, mm-hmm. and will, will, will support that individual, you mm-hmm. know, uh, to ensure that he or she um, experiences forgiveness or experiences, uh, you know, uh, engages in, 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 in hope-filled uh, uh, exercises. Uh, but I think these prayers are also about acknowledging uh, that God is a just God. Okay? Hmm. And the justice of God entails, yes, some punishment. Hmm. Okay? And, and uh, for wrongdoing. It's, uh, and so, uh, so it, it, heaping curses and calling for all this evil to fall upon the enemies is uh, is a belief in uh, in a God who will, uh, you know, who, uh, who who is who is a just God and therefore will uh, will. It mm. says something about the the nature of this God mm. whom they believe in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah. Linda, Linda, did you have anything you wanted? Yeah, like, I, I mean, we've spoken about this already. Again, I guess I think it shows that the Psalms express every emotion, even hate, the things that we think we're not allowed to say out loud. Um, and it helps us to, it models to us and artic- how to articulate that back to God. Um, and I think it shows us that God does invite our honest prayers. He invites our heart, whatever that looks like, whatever that looks like at any point in time, whether that's positive or negative. Um, and we've talked about, and I think this is this is part of how we're made, how God made us, that we're not made to suppress emotion. You know, he wants to hear us and to feel emotion and process emotion is to express emotion um, as well. And 
as Monica said, it does speak to what the psalmist sees, how the psalmist sees God as a just God and God as judge and trusting that by presenting these curses before God, it's not asking for God's resources or opportunity to enact these curses, but handing them to God and trusting that you will do, you will um, bring justice um, and you will um, get rid of injustice, so to speak. So I think, yeah, that's the way I see see these yeah. Yeah. tricky songs, allowing us yeah, to turn yeah. stuff over to God. Yeah, read, read Nahum, Nahum, for example. <laughs> you know, I mean, the language there is is just very, very difficult. But I, I think one has to understand what kind of a person would actually pray, pray that kind of a prayer. What has this person gone through? Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, this may sound rather cliche, but I think if you're watching a movie and there is a guy who is... <laughs> Who is the perpetrator of of, of evil? Uh, you know, we we see ourselves rooting for the death of that person, mm. right? I mean, mm. That's a very human response. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's really helpful. Um, Jed had a nice comment, which is you know both how these these psalm might you know save us from the actual impulse of retaliation, but it also calls us into community with those people uh, who must be so weary of displacement, daily violence, abuse, and cruelty. If we pray Psalm 109, we, joy the, we join the prayer of those who take God seriously and whose lives are heavy with darkness. And, and I think, like, I, think I, I echo that. And the only other thought I, was offer, I would offer is that, you know, th this kind of prayer for one's enemy, one reminds us of something earlier of Monica's point that there are people with actual enemies uh, and, and much of our lives is insulated from that. Mm. And that um, we might also, it maybe disorients us or challenges us that have we too long associated, like, pray or enculturated praying for enemies and loving enemies with a kind of middle class being nice to them like i don't think it's it's yeah. it's a way to love my neighbor is to pray for my neighbor's enemy to be you know have their prosperity and and, and just to be nice to them you mm -hmm. know um to take just like a a, a kind of absurd not an absurd example but an example would be like someone like let's talk about like jeff bezos who's worth $157 billion or whatever, and has only grown richer in this pandemic when so many people have lost work. You know, that shows that there's an inequality in this system and, and, and a true brokenness. The mm -hmm. way to love Jeff Bezos is not just be nice to Jeff Bezos, it is a la Jesus and Zacchaeus to uh, liberate Jeff Bezos from $157.9 uh, billion, $156.9 billion, right? He can have 100,000 or so to spare. But like it is to, to, to free him and, and, and distribute that so that he can be drawn back into community that he can be drawn back into his you know realization that you have to be reliant on people and god and things like that that's how you love someone is to, is to set is to work to set them free um from from as monica said even those who are oppressing are, are themselves being dehumanized through that so so mm -hmm. loving enemies isn't you know we've got to be careful of the way if we you know have that challenge to us that have we just allowed love and and prayer to be associated simply with with a kind of niceness Mm. All right, so we've hit time. We've hit time. Um, I, I know I had the final word, but anyway, there we go. Um, this has been great. This has been wonderful. Thank you mm. to those who have joined and, and commented. And there's been a great discussion in the comments. People should check that out. Lots of different, uh, you know, questions and quotes and, and comments being shared. Uh, I want to thank my wonderful panelists, uh, Renee and Lyndall and Monica. Uh, I'm going I'm to throw it out if you have anything to plug. Monica in particular, you might want to, we were talking off mic about a course that you're teaching uh, in, in first semester next year at Pilgrim Theological College that, you know, if people have liked tonight and want to go further, this might be one of those ways. So maybe you start, promote anything you want to promote and then, uh, I don't know, Lyndall and Renee might have something they want to, they, they can shout out as well. Okay. Well, I am teaching an intensive on the Psalms uh, in the month of March. Um, but besides that, I've uh, designed a new, a new unit um, on, uh, on, on the books that, uh, that have uh, women protagonists, uh, namely Esther, Ruth, uh, Judith, Susanna, and, and also the Song of Songs. Uh, and these books with women protagonists have come to life within a patriarchal culture with very strong gender stereotypes and multiple barriers uh, to women. Um, but these books are known 
uh, well for their powerful narratives uh, and the art and the, and the uh, imagination. So the question is, are the women protagonists in these books uh, feminist heroines or, uh, or are they uh, patriarchally idealized stooges, you know? Um, uh, so are these, can, uh, should, do we look at these books as protest or in subversive literature or something else? So, uh, so the unit will introduce you to these books uh, and the stories within these books are uh, retold and uh, we will be analyzing their very elusive uh, complexity. Uh, we will attend to issues of, of gender, of identity, of sexuality, of agency, of beauty, uh, of partnership, uh, about widowhood, uh, and also look at uh, these women have been represented in the visual arts. Uh, so we will bring uh, those interpretations uh, in art form as well into conversation with the written uh, with the written word. Oh, that's great. And I agree with Kate in the comments. What a great unit. Uh, people can audit it. You don't even have to be a, you know, uh, enrolled in a, in a degree. You can audit these kind of these classes. So check out Pilgrim Theological College and, and inquire about getting involved in that course particularly if you need some professional development done, uh, but even if you're just looking to, you know, deepen your own uh, life with scripture. So thank you for that. Yeah. Linda, Renee, do you want to shout anything out as we, we come to a close? Sure. I mean, I'll take this opportunity. Um, I am a part of um, the Marrickville Baptist Church plan, um, and it's all just fresh and starting and happening. Um, but if you live in the inner west of Sydney, if you love the inner west of Sydney, <laughs> um, chase me down on Facebook. I'd love to share what we're doing, um, it's all very COVID safe and small scale at this point, but it's been really fun um, to be a part of that. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank oh, there's a, I, and I am running a, a Praxis group on sustainability and waste and theology in November. So if that interests you as well, just message me. Renee <laughs> Evans on Facebook you. if you need to find Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Linda. I don't have anything to plug, but I do want to say thank you, Liam um, and Monica and Renee. I think um, thank you for where this conversation has gone. Um, I really appreciate it and listening and learning from you guys. So thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank I you. Echo that. Thank you. All. Thank you. And thank you all who have watched. Uh, you can tell your friends that they can find this on uh, at, by subscribing to Love, Rinse, Repeat in their podcast app or find us on Spotify or on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. And yeah, I guess Tukli Uniting Church, if you're up on the Central Coast, you can come check us out. Bye.